Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, another product in our security, security portfolio called AppDefense. So, you know, I think uh, you heard Tom Corn speak about this or reference this a little bit in the beginning. Uh, but really, and I'm going to go quickly because we don't have a ton of time and I want to show you guys some things live. But if you think about what AppDefense does and what it adds to the equation, uh, it's really about extending this idea of zero trust and least privilege all the way up into the workload into the application layer. So the idea is we wanted to leverage the hypervisor as a place to basically inspect, control, and manage behavior inside of the virtual machine itself, all with knowledge of things running inside of the endpoint, right? So have better knowledge of direct layer seven activity, application level activity, endpoint level activity, and use that as part of the security controls. Uh, and I'll skip over some of this uh, stuff, but basically, you know, you got the gist of what Tom said, which is we want to deal mostly with things that are in the propagation and extraction phases of attacks, right? Instead of trying to deal with pure infiltration events, you know, we get that question a lot. You know, do you stop a buffer overflow? Do you stop a SQL injection attack? Uh, the goal is not necessarily to stop those initial infiltration, but instead stop the ability for an attacker to do anything to propagate the attack and extract data afterwards, which in theory should be an easier place for the defender to actually uh, defend what's going on. Um, and all of this is based off this notion of validating known good behavior versus chasing bad behavior. And this is an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, and the reason why this is important is it essentially leverages, I think, what VMware's greatest strength here is, which is the idea that we can continuously <coughs> provide intelligence about what is normal expected state behavior for a virtual machine and for a particular application type. Uh, so I'll talk about as we go forward what we refer to as the app defense verification cloud. And what that does is it actually models normalcy across our population. We collect information from running virtual machines. We look at their normal behavior. We send that up into a collective kind of brain in the sky. And that brain in the sky acts as something that continu can continuously verify behaviors that we see in new virtual machines as they come up. And those things, a verification engine, acts as the thing that helps us spot anomalies and deviations from normalcy. So instead of having a team of threat researchers, an army of people trying to hunt and find specific threat vectors, we instead focus on understanding normal behavior across our 60 million virtual machine population, and then using that normalcy to spot for anomalies in other people's environments. Uh, so that's the distinction, distinction that we'll talk through here, and I'll show you some examples of that. Now, how much of that distinction is driven based upon VMware analytics and intelligence versus mm -hmm. Carbon Black implementation and adoption? Yeah, so Carbon Black uh, is a piece of the puzzle. So what we, the best way I can describe this is we take our understanding of normalcy, which is entirely VMware focused, mm -hmm. and then we layer on threat and reputation feeds from Carbon Black and others, not just them, but they're mm -hmm. part of that puzzle. Uh, the they were first, so that's why I'm here. Yeah, yeah, the Carbon Black integration, uh, that's an inherent piece of app defense, meaning that you don't have to purchase Carbon Black to get that. It's just a licensed threat feed, and then we license in other reputation feeds as well. So it's a combination of factors in the cloud, uh, and then I'll, I'll walk through some of that specific. So <clears throat> the way this works, right, is we want to be able to provide uh, capturing and analyzing of intended state. So we want to think of this as we first want to model what we expect to see in your environment specifically. And this is what we refer to as the learn phase. Uh, it's very hard to enforce any type of least privilege, zero trust security, unless you first go through a modeling or learning phase. So every time a VM is kind of inserted into the app defense domain, we first start profiling it and learning what's expected state. Um, and the way in which this works is we combine what we refer to as provisioning states or configuration states with runtime learning. So provisioning state is kind of the things that Jeff was just walking through where someone is pushing a new application via Kubernetes, they're provisioning new uh, systems via Puppet or Ansible Tower, whatever it might be, we use those as initial indicators of the security policy. And the specific things we're looking for there is what type of machine are you pushing and what type of application are you running on top of this machine. Uh, and that allows us to start creating profiles. So if you create a Windows 2012 machine, it comes with a default profile for Windows 2012. If you then say you're running SQL Server on top of that, we can push a specific profile for SQL Server on top of that. That's all information that we get from provisioning integrations and provisioning state. We augment all of that in all cases with runtime learning. So natively, without the use of additional agents, we have the ability of collecting and gathering data at runtime. And this is standard event-based data that you get from most endpoint agents in the security world, right? Uh, process data, user data, file data, network connectivity data, registry data, kernel uh, information about what's loaded. All of those events uh, essentially get piped through the ESX host, through VM tools, 
and then uh, basically provide us with intelligence about what's running, at, uh, what's happening at runtime. The, the key thing in all of this, though, is every piece of information that we get hits this verification cloud. So uh, this is a SaaS service. It's delivered as a SaaS service. We protect on-premise environments. But every piece of data that we collect gets sent up to the cloud for verification. And the cloud, what it does is it basically provides you with an answer, yes or no. Do we like this? Do we not like this based on what we've seen in the past? Or actually a third answer, which is we don't have enough information to verify this. Um, and that verification step is important, right? Because you want to be able to provide as much automation as possible in the learning phase because you don't want to have people having to build and create manual policies themselves. But as part of that verification process, you need something that's helping you along the way because these rules get way too granular and way too esoteric in order for a human to go through all of them. So given the fact that we can verify you know, 90 to 95% of behaviors on a machine, you now only have your humans having to look at the last 5% you know, of behaviors to verify those things. That spits out something called an application scope. Think of an application scope as, you know, these are the things that we expect to see off this device. These are the, the kind of behaviors we expect to happen. Uh, it's, it's kind of a governing rule set for what we want to happen on that machine. Any questions? Uh, this is an example of sort of um, what the manifest looks like in visual form. So I'll show this, uh, you know, in uh, the app defense uh, console if we get time for demo. But basically think of this as all the behaviors that we're learning, we're profiling, we're gathering, will provide you that information and visualization so that you can kind of see the way your application is behaving. Um, and then we also provide details of what makes up each individual piece of that overall application. Um, on the protect side, there are some interesting aspects that we leverage off of the hypervisor here on the protect side of the fence. So once we've learned and profiled this, at that point, we want to be able to start pushing and creating security policy and security rules. Um, the really cool innovation here is this use of the hypervisor to create trusted execution environments for the app defense controls. So uh, think of it as you, know, you want to be able to enforce behavior specifically inside of the operating system. But the operating system is the place that's most vulnerable to attack, right? So if, a, if, a, if, a, if an attacker gets root access on that machine, or even if they don't get root access, they have the ability to manipulate or turn off almost any security control that exists there. So the hypervisor itself creates a protected portion of memory that cannot be tampered with by anything else running inside of the operating system. Um, and that's something that can really only be done if you have a hypervisor layer providing that intermediate memory validation and protection. Um, you know, so think of the app defense monitor as running uh, a step above you know, where you are running to traditionally things like the NSX distributed firewall, which is embedded directly inside the, the host. The app defense monitor is sitting inside of guest memory, but it's inside a protected, you know, quarantined off area of guest memory that cannot be tampered, or at least is tamper evident. Uh, and that's a huge security benefit, right? So you solve the operational burden of agents. You also solve the security uh, implications of agents by having the hypervisor provide you with this mechanism for protection. Any questions here? So what this detect phase is doing is it's looking for deviations against what's happening back here. And those deviations can act as anomaly detection events, like, hey, I saw something different. Here's the evaluation of how different it is. Here's the evaluation of any potential threat. Uh, or it can go ahead and just block that behavior immediately. So if you want to run in full zero trust mode, just simply block it or stop it. A lot of people don't feel comfortable with that level of quote unquote whitelisting. So you simply have a anomaly detection mode where you can kind of detect alerts, feed those into your SIM system, and then you can respond and take action accordingly. In the tamper evident memory space, was mm -hmm. it found to be protected or still vulnerable to a meltdown inspector and other known things? Yeah, so uh, it, um, Meltdown Inspector did have implications over the protected memory. So uh, the gist of it is uh, ESX had to do a patch in order for Spectre and Meltdown to be fixed. Once ESX was patched, then the temper evidence space was perfectly fine. But you had to do a patch of ESX in order to uh, address that. But you guys never saw a weaponized exploit against that, no. right? It was all theoretical? Absolutely not. All right. Uh, we published, actually, a, an external write-up on this, Inspector and Meltdown, if you're mm -hmm. interested. Um, so then the last piece of this puzzle is adaptation. So if there's one thing I can guarantee you is that the data center activity is going to change, right? So if you create this profile, 
You say, I expect the machine to behave in a certain way. Very few customers have the kind of discipline to make sure that their machines don't deviate off of that expected profile. So you have constant change that you're dealing with that you have to address and manage. In a traditional sort of whitelisting, least privileged world, that change would be just a simple false positive and it would cause operational burden for users. And that was something we wanted to address right out of the, right out of the gate. So <clears throat> we look at every single event that comes through in the detect phase and we pull that back to the uh, app defense verification engine and we say, is this something that is normal expected change or something that we've been able to model down to a uh, normal event? And if so, we can auto adjust the policy to reflect that this should be allowed. So an example is a software upgrade. If we detect software upgrades using knowledge of the rest of the ecosystem, we can verify that that software is okay and we'll update your allow behavior to allow that binary to run. Uh, another example is uh, you know, a, a executable communicating on a different port on the network or communicating to a different IP address. The machine learning engine in, in the verification cloud will say, hey, we have seen across the rest of our population that this binary uses this port quite often. It becomes an activity that we can verify and then we can adjust behavior. How quickly? So it takes about five minutes round trip. Uh, I'll show you that in the demo. Uh, everything has to hit the cloud before it can be verified and then set down. So one question we get a lot is what if you have a block rule running, right? And then how do you deal with that? Uh, block rules, the initial behavior will get blocked until we've able to verify it and then we can send down a rule to adjust that. Uh, but that's a, a, man a manifest of running in block mode. If you're running in alert mode, you know, technically you won't even see the alert until it's been classified anyway, so you won't even notice that there's, there's a lag. So app defense is a protection mechanism for you know, Windows servers and supported Linux variants and stuff like that, yes, right? Yes, 100%. But if I'm VDI, mm -hmm. do, we, we, we don't have an option for that, is that fair? So we, we do not currently encourage use with VDI, just simply because I don't think that VDI is a great use case for zero trust type of protection. Uh, unless it's a VDI environment where it's like a, a, a single use system, a kiosk sometimes, a point of sale system, we see a lot of use cases like that. It's not really a technical limitation, it's a use case limitation. Is, would it be theoretically supported? Because I mean, I know from a release note standpoint, it's not officially supported. Exactly, you yeah. could deploy it on a Windows yes. 10 machine or yes, something. Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, so the Windows 10 kernel looks very similar to Windows 2012 kernel. We do officially support Windows 2012. We've tested on Windows 10. It works. We don't publish it just because we don't want people getting themselves in trouble. That, that's um, absolutely fair. So we do get this question a lot and we do allow people. We've had a number of POCs running for VDI. But you wouldn't want a you know, 20,000 VDI deployment. Oh, you would, no. but not running yeah. the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I think we, you know, limited use VDI for, for I would say, single use systems, point of sale, kiosks are good use cases for this. Uh, and then obviously regular server based environments. Um, so I just want to touch on these things again, right? Tre reason why people don't really deploy least privileged security is this, you know, number one, they don't like deploying agents in their servers. They tend to be operationally difficult and they tend to take up a lot of room. They don't have the trust of ensuring that that agent is actually doing enforcement. Uh, they have a hard time dealing with behavioral issues. Most you know, traditional security agents deal more with file-based events. They don't deal with behavioral-based events. Uh, you have to create rules manually, which is often difficult. And then they really have a hard time dealing with change. And all of these things we've kind of built in as, as capabilities uh, that App Defense provides natively out of the gate. Um, the most important is this idea of reducing and eliminating the need for agents, right? So I think this is something that we can't stress enough uh, with this idea that, number one, there's no additional agent that needs to be deployed. If you're running VM tools 10.3 or above with ESX 6.5, you have everything that you need to run App Defense already in your environment. The second piece is, the the agent or the component that's built into VM tools natively runs in this protected mode and runs in this integrity mode. So it is a requirement to run ESX 6.5. The reason for that is the hypervisor has to provide us with this integrity, uh, you know, at least at this stage of the product. What's the approximate overhead? I remember what it was a few years ago, but I'm mm. curious these days what the overhead is. Yeah, I mean, from a uh, in-guest memory perspective, it's super low. So it's like less than 1% CPU utilization. And, and uh, for a TCP packet monitoring, it's really negligible. Mm -hmm. For UDP, we see some overhead just because we have to evaluate the recreation of the session over and over again. So it's about 3 to 5% throughput impact on UDP, but generally speaking, it's super low. Mm -hmm. Now, if uh, in the host itself, uh, the host itself will have some memory consumption or have to ha take some memory uh, for the collection of data inside of the host, right? Mm -hmm. So as we pull all this information down from the guest, it gets stored locally inside of the host. So we do recommend, I think it's 512 gig of memory that's get set aside in the host for that. 
Um, I have to check that exact number. But there is a memory requirement in the host just to make sure that we collect data appropriately and we tee it up there. And would you see people adopt this on the server platforms, and et cetera, as a replacement for or in addition to uh, using some other traditional antivirus or something? Yeah, so most common thing that people will get rid of are things like host-based intrusion prevention and host-based intrusion detection devices, traditional whitelisting solutions. We haven't really gotten to the point to say that you should switch out AV, mm -hmm. mostly because AV is a compliance requirement. It tend, doesn't be a, it's not really a big uh, cost burden. Uh, so we just kind of say, run alongside AV, everything's fine. But they don't step on each other is the other no, side of no, that. No, no, no. We run alongside AV all the time. Okay. Uh, and then there are situations like we have a partnership with Carbon Black with a product called CB Defense where we do recommend removing AV in that regard. So that combination has switched out other AV vendors sure. successfully. Uh, and that's the reason why we partner with them. Chris, do you guys monitor development frameworks too along with processes? Development frameworks like like, like a MySQL driver or, or like a jQuery that that would change, but wouldn't actually be running. Like I'm running Nginx, but as a MySQL driver, yeah, that is either vulnerable or new. Would mm. you would AppDefense catch that? So AppDefense would monitor the downstream behavior that those things initiated. So I, I guess one example would be like a Python interpreter, right? Yeah. So the Python interpreter to us would look like the Python binary. Yeah. So what we do is we monitor the command line arguments that were used when the Python interpreter was spun up, meaning which script did you load into that. We look at the memory contents of the application that's running currently uh, in the Python interpreter. So we'll give you a full dump of all DLLs that have been loaded into memory when that behavior occurred. And then we'll obviously evaluate the downstream events that are occurring. So if, if your Python script all of a sudden starts to communicate across the network, yeah. uh, and this is the case with PowerShell very often, we can t recognize that that behavior is bad. Not necessarily that the binary is bad, but the behavior is bad. And that's how we kind of handle those things. And then we'll give you a DLL dump of everything that's running in memory so you can evaluate. The same application for PowerShell as, as for Python. I'll show, you, I'll show you a PowerShell example right now. So that, that would help. Um, all right, so I'm going to go quickly here because we only have five minutes. But, but basically what I'm going to do is... Uh, can you make your font size a little bigger? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little. Keep going. Really? <laughs> I think larger. Uh, is it good? Enhance. Yeah. All right, so uh, none of this isn't super important, but I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run uh, a few attack vectors here, right? Um, skip through some of the earlier steps. But I have an application set up, and I'm essentially going to provide uh, and try to get shell access to this application. So we're sitting behind right now a standard, you know, perimeter-based control point. The application is is running, um, you know, active, running, set up, right? This is, you know, something we showed at VMworld. It's just this Cords Cords three-tier application. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to use port 53 and port 80 to create a reverse TCP cell, uh, shell connection. Um, and I'm able to do this pretty easily because I'm using a, an exploit called Drupal Geddon. So this is running Drupal as its back end. Yeah. And using Drupal Geddon, I'm just able to run a full shell. So pretty easily was able to get in, right? Now I'm logged in as administrator. So I'm just going to show you an example here where I'm just going to run in and disable AV on the environment. And I'll just show you in real time how, how easy that is to do. All right, so AV is running. Uh, now I'm just going to run the same script again. In this case, once I pop in, I'm going to run a PowerShell script to disable AV. And now we were able to turn it off, right? Uh, so once you have access there, you can pretty much do anything you want. So um, yeah, what I'll, I'll do is I'll skip uh, a few steps. Um, you know, we've showed in some cases running kind of mimicats, running a pass the hash attack, doing crypto jacking. All these scripts are embedded in here. We don't have a ton of time, so I'm just actually going to uh, ransomware this device, right? Um, <laughs> Oh, actually, sorry. I did that on the wrong machine. Hold on. A little bit uh, backed up here.
Okay. Um, never mind that for a second. So uh, I was uh, essentially <laughs> trying to run this ransomware attack, but I'm a little bit out of order, so I'd normally be run through all these steps at the same time, which is causing an issue here. Um, so what I'll show you is what AppDefense provides from a native visibility point of view. So this is the application that's set up as is. Um, and if I take a look at some of the behaviors that are occurring here, this is all the verification steps that we provide. So in each one of these examples, this is all the, the behavior that's occurring on the machine. And we provide you essentially with a full set of whether we've been able to validate that the binary is correct and whether we've been able to validate that the behavior is correct. So as we go through and look at this, you know, there are certain kind of, kind of uh, attributes you want to check against the running executable. And there are certain kind of attributes you want to check against the, the port and the protocol usage. <clears throat> are you checking the, uh, any digital signature on that, on that EXE? Or uh, just the hash? Yeah, we certainly check digital signatures. So we check, uh, we check basically who's the signee. We check uh, you know, who the publisher is. Uh, okay. We check the reputation using cool. third-party reputation tools. Uh, and then the hash is used, obviously, to do verification. The other mechanisms that we use for process reputation are something called dis distributed consensus or kind of social assurance. So we'll take that hash and we'll look to see who else has whitelisted that hash across the rest of the VMware population, then we have enough people voting up that hash that is a whitelisted binary, we can verify it ourselves without having to use any of the external third parties. And then the behavioral verification happens through uh, essentially the machine learning algorithm. So each behavior that comes in, meaning we see Explorer communicating TCP port 443, we will then uh, take that and um, uh, say that that is verified allowed behavior so that we can actually provide you with the understanding of what network activity is happening from that process, not just the process itself. I'm just gonna quickly throw this into protect mode so that we can um, show an example of that same attack, but with AppDefense watching over it. One other thing that we also integrated in was this notion of pushing and creating firewall rules based off of the app defense uh, collectivity uh, or connect, uh, uh, collective behavior. So there was a check mark there that I briefly glossed over, but that's basically taking all this inherent learning and pushing that down into the NSX firewall, right? So as we collect and verify data, we can push now that into the NSX firewall. The other thing that we did is we integrated in uh, this behavioral intelligence into the uh, vCenter console. So um, a customer can easily turn on vCenter uh, or turn on AppDefense uh, through vCenter by just clicking enable and going. And then we also provide you with this intelligence here. So this, in this case, when I was getting shell before, uh, I was getting shell on the environment that was being monitored by AppDefense. And now we can see we have a low reputation process PowerShell running. There's a high risk process running and you can see that directly in vCenter. Uh, and then if you want to go deeper into this, um, you can actually look where did PowerShell run. You know, it ran on the app tier. Uh, dig into that and see what did PowerShell actually try to do um, by looking at its connectivity behavior. So in this case, it tried to communicate on port 80, tried to communicate on port 53. This was essentially <coughs> a reverse TCP connection that I was trying to create. Um, and this is directly embedded in vCenter as uh, visibility only. And then as you move into app defense, you can create protection rules based off of these things. So I can now start enforcing these behaviors. So before I was running in discovery mode, which is why we didn't stop that behavior. But once I have it in protect mode, which I have it in now, uh, you can basically go ahead and start enforcing different types of events. Like I want to alert on this, I want to block on this, uh, I want to do some other major event like quarantine machines based off of this. So you can take more granular security control based on the event. 